Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Now, of course, normally when we would read this, we think of um, all his wondrous works and his deeds. We think of all the things he's done in people's lives, what he's done for his people. <clears throat> we read, glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek Jehovah rejoice. But of course, his wondrous works is also <clears throat> creation. You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Tell of all his wondrous works. Declare him the creator of all things and give him glory. Bless Jehovah, O my soul. O Jehovah, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. Covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariots. He rides on the wings of the wind. And he makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. He set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. And you covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. And at your rebuke they fled at the sound of your thunder. They took to flight. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass so that they may not again cover the earth. You make springs gush forth in the valleys, they flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field, the wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them the birds of the heavens dwell, they sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. Tell of all his wondrous works. I think when you come to the Lord, you get an appreciation of creation that you never had before because you have an appreciation of the creator. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate that he may bring forth food from the earth. And wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. <coughs> the trees of Jehovah are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests, the stalk is their home in the fir trees. And the high mountains are for the wild goats, the rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. He made the moon to mark the seasons, the sun knows its time for setting. You make darkness and it is night when all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work, into his labor until the evening. O Jehovah, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Tell of all his wondrous works. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures, innumerable living things, both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you form to play in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. You get a real sense in this bit of scripture, don't you? Of Yehovah, the creator of all things. Um, <clears throat> may the Lord, may the glory of Yehovah endure forever. May Yehovah rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to Jehovah as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. Amazing bit of scripture. Back to the song of David, we read, Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. And often you see this in scripture, this link between the wondrous works of the Lord, <coughs> including all of creation and singing and giving him praise. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. And later in the song, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. 
It was nonsense. But Yehovah made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. So as the creator, Yehovah is distinguished above all others. We serve a set-apart God. There is none like him. O Yehovah Zavayot, the God of Israel, he was enthroned above the cherubim. You are the God. You alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Now Jonah and Abraham, Melchizedek identified their God as the creator, the God of all things. We read with Jonah. The word of Yehovah came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of Yehovah. He went down to Joppa and found a ship to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of Yehovah. But Yehovah hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise and call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? He said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear Yehovah, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. So in this um, society in which he lives, where they all have gods that they all cry out to, um, Jonah identifies Yehovah as the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is it that you've done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of Yehovah because he had told them. And they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to Yehovah, O Yehovah, let us not perish for this man's life. Lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Yehovah, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared Yehovah exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to Yehovah and made vows. We know how the rest of the story goes, but here we have Jonah referring to Yehovah as the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. And when the sailors recognized that Jonah's Elohim is Yehovah, the creator who has power over his creation, they greatly fear him. But most people today have no fear of Yehovah. They don't see him as the great creator. Which is sad when we consider what we read in Psalm 33. The eye of Yehovah is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love that he may dis deliver their soul from death. And I think that recognizing Yehovah is the creator of all things is very powerful. It puts everything into perspective. Thus says God, Yehovah, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am Yehovah, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, the new things I now declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. For I know that Yehovah is great and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever Yehovah pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightning for the rain and brings forth the wind from his storehouses. So, perspective. What perspective do we have? Yehovah knows the future. He made 
everything. It is because of him that I have life. In his hand, we read, is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. But of course, these truths elude most people, don't they? He does whatever he pleases. Isaiah 40. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we might be alike? Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. It was lovely in Sukkot, wasn't it? Because uh, there was some really clear skies where we could see loads of the sky the stars. Um, Jeff was teaching me about <laughs> constellations and stuff. Uh, it was good. He brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown. Scarcely is their stem taking root in the earth. When he blows on them, they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. She always brings to mind this. A king's heart is like streams of water in the Lord's hand. He directs it wherever he chooses. He is the creator of all things. He is sovereign over all things. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. We're invited here to actually look and see the heavens and start to recognize how great Yehovah is. Why do you say, O Yaakov, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from Yehovah, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? Yehovah is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait, Kavor, for Yehovah, shall renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings like eagles, they shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. And this word here, Kavor, primitive root to bind together. I wait for Yehovah, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. The steadfast love, the chesed of Yehovah never ceases. His mercies, his compassions never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Yehovah is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. That word is yechal, and it can mean wait also. Because Yehovah is good to those who wait kavah for him, to the soul who seeks him. And the verb translated wait is the Hebrew word kavah. Maybe better translated, look for with anticipation or hope. And the root of this verb actually appears in the Hebrew word for hope, tikva. So wait on Yehovah, which we've seen to be bound to him, hoping in him, hoping in his word, because they're linked, abiding in his word. Yehovah is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. So to wait on Yehovah is to seek him. And of course, as we know, we live in a world where people do not seek Yehovah. They do not wait for him. They do not recognize who he is. They have no idea. But the Lord says this. He says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. We also have a world full of people. Who are not prepared to seek him with all their heart. So when is it the right time to seek Yehovah? Seek him while he might be found and call upon him while he is near. And again, I look to a world that's so busy getting on with their lives, too busy for this, too busy for that, or maybe one day. But the Lord says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to Yehovah that he might have compassion on him. We've just read that the Lord is compassionate to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. <coughs> Excuse me. To seek Yehovah involves repentance, turning to walk in his ways. 
We know that whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy, compassion, rakam. To seek Yehovah is to surrender to him. Now, the, the reason I introduced these scriptures here about waiting on him and seeking him is because the two things that are impressed upon me when I read about the creation account is the greatness of Yehovah, the importance of recognizing him as creator, but also the response that should come along with that which is to humble yourself before him. To seek Yehovah is to surrender to him, to be humble before him, which is the opposite of stiff-necked, rebellious, hard-hearted, and defiant. <coughs> then Job answered and said, I know it is so of a truth, but how should man be just with God? If he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. He is wise in heart, mighty in strength, who has hardened himself against him and has prospered. And yet so many people try. He removes the mountains and they know not, which overturns them in his anger. Shakes the earth out of her place and the pillars thereof tremble. He commands the sun and it rises not and seals up the stars. Who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea. Who made the bear and Orion, the Pleiades, and the chambers of the south. He does great things beyond searching out, <coughs> and marvelous things beyond number. <coughs> Behold, he passes by me, and I see him not. He moves on, but I do not perceive him. <coughs> Excuse me. Behold, he snatches away who can turn him back. He will say to him, what are you doing? And again, I marvel that there's people all over the world who, in folly, do think they can challenge Jehovah, would go against him, think it's okay to twist his word and to be stiff-necked, disobedient, and rebellious. We read he is unchangeable. Who can turn him back? You can't persuade him. You can't change his mind. You can't change his way to fit and make it be what you want it to be. We read what he does, what he desires, he does. For he will complete what he appoints for me. And many such things are in his mind. <coughs> Therefore, I am terrified at his presence when I consider I am in dread of him. God has made my heart faint and the Almighty has terrified me. <clears throat> I don't know if anybody else has ever been in this situation and experienced this, the dread of him. <clears throat> but it's a much safer place to be than to be somebody who's arrogant and has no idea how foolish they're being. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. The lot is cast into the lap. It's every decision is from the Lord. Again, recognizing that Yehovah is the creator of all things and recognizing that he is sovereign is an incredibly powerful thing to do. That perspective is really important. He is sovereign. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am Yehovah who does all these things. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain down righteousness, lest the earth open, let salvation and righteousness may bear fruit. Let the earth cause both of them to sprout, <coughs> them both to sprout. I, Jehovah, have created it. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making, or your handiwork say, he has no hands? So woe to him who strives with his maker. And knowing that God is the creator of all things should make us hesitant to oppose him in any way. It is as foolish as for the clay to say to him who forms it, what are you making? And then we read, or oh, surely a handiwork say, he has no hands. The only thing more foolish than the creature resisting and opposing the creator 
is for the creature to believe that there is no creator. Isaiah pictures a clay pot, the handiwork of the potter saying, my potter has no hands. In other words, I have no creator. <clears throat> so many people obviously fall into that category. Now, Abraham and the events after he rescues Lot. We read, and he, Melchizedek, blessed him and said, blessed be Abraham by God most high, possessor uh, <clears throat> of heaven and earth. The word is kona, or to the creator. It can also be translated as it is in the LXX, God who made heaven and earth. And the king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to Jehovah, God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And I would not take a thread or a sandal strap, or anything that is yours, lest you should say, <coughs> I have made Abraham rich. So, <coughs> excuse me. In identifying who is prostrated him, Abraham refers to his Elohim as Jehovah, God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. He credits Jehovah as being sovereign over the events of his life and also clearly identifies his Elohim as the one who, as creator, possesses all heaven and earth. Tell of all his wondrous works. I keep coming back to this because... When I've been reading about um, creation and stuff, I always look to the opposition to it, and it really, I don't know, it just really, really winds me up. <clears throat> you see throughout Scripture that the Lord receives glory because He is the creator of all things, and yet we live in a world which tries to deny Him that glory. When I look at the, the, the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Jeremiah. Our Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Again, these people are recognizing who Jehovah is. And as we've noted many times previously, <clears throat> when we want to know who Jehovah is, we look to his word. And one of the most important things to recognize is that he is the creator. He is Lord of all creation. And the word begins with this huge statement. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Bang. It's a pretty big statement. <laughs> and if you can't acknowledge this, then I don't see how the rest of the word can make any sense to you. Of course, the God of this world, <clears throat> we read, is the father of lies. Um, hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world um, has come, has nothing in me. So the prince of this world, we read here, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this world has blinded the mind of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And who is this going on about? It's going on about the devil. He is a liar and the father of it. And in the world, we find a strong attack against the fundamental truth that Jehovah is the creator of all things, which kind of makes sense when you consider the God of this world being the father of lies. But we read in Revelation 4, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. The Lord says, I won't give my glory to any other. So we're told, tell of all his wondrous works but in the world we have. No, you don't. We have a theory. There will be no credit in glory and honor and power to the God of the Bible as creator. We read things like this. <clears throat> Today, the theory of evolution is an accepted fact for everyone but a fundamentalist minority whose objections are based not on reasoning, but on doctrinal adherence to religious principles. Okay, so it's a fact, except for these people, basically saying, except for these people who are a bit balmy, you've got no evidence, they just believe some crazy stuff. But in 1 Corinthians 3, it says, the wisdom of this world is folly with God, for it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. 
And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. Romans 1, they became futile in their thinking, their foolish hearts were dark and claiming to be wise, they became fools. Now we have this today in science history, <coughs> Paul Brown. All that stuff I was taught about evolution, embryology, Big Bang Theory, all that is lies straight from the pit of hell. It's lies to try to keep me and all the folks who were taught that from understanding that they need a savior. So what's the response to this? This is, a mis, mis, this is a, an article, and there we have the guy, Paul Brown, and there we have Darwin, don't we? And it reads, revealing his anti-science views, contrary to the qualifications needed to make important public policy on matters of science. So, it's not gone down well, as it what he said there. Read, the theory of evolution is an accepted fact for everyone but a fundamentalist minority. So, in the public sphere, here we see somebody pilloried because he won't accept this fact <coughs> that the theory of evolution is the truth. We read in the blind watchmaker, all appearances to the contrary, the only watchmaker in nature is the blind forces of physics, albeit deployed in a very special way. A true watchmaker has foresight, he designs his cog springs and plans their interconnections with a future purpose in his mind's eye. Natural selection, the blind, unconscious, automatic process which Darwin discovered and which we now know, we now know is the explanation for the existence and apparently purposeful form of all life, has no purpose in mind. Has no mind, has no mind's eye, it does not plan for the future, it has no vision, no foresight, no sight at all. It can be said to play the role of watchmaker in nature, it is the blind watchmaker. Okay, so that was... Richard Dawkins' take on everything, which we now know is the explanation for the existence of all things. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, I come back to Scripture. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. And I was reading through this stuff as well. When you read Scripture, it kind of, it makes you feel, I don't know, it lifts you up, doesn't it? It's like food for your, for your soul. I'm going to read through what these people are saying. There's such, like, I don't know, like a darkness and an ugliness to some of the things they say. Here we go. An evolutionary perspective of our place in the history of the earth reminds us that Homo sapiens, sapiens has occupied the planet for the tiniest fraction of that planet's four and a half thousand million years of existence. In many ways, we are a biological accident, the product of countless propitious circumstances. So we're just an accident. There is no law that declares the human animal to be different as seen in this broad biological perspective from any other animal. Just the same as all the others, really. That's Richard E. Leakey, co-author with American science writer Roger Amos Lewin. And, uh, from 46, what new discoveries reveal about the emergence of our species and its possible future. What do we read in Scripture? God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he, um, he created him, male and female, he created them. Here we see that it is God that creates man. The word for created is bara, meaning he fattened or filled. And the word translated as image is actually selem, which can be translated as shadow. And if you go through all these words here, there they all are, you get something more like the powerful one, Yehovah filled the man with his shadow. Salem shadow. Yehovah took a represent representation of himself and put it within man. We read later, Genesis 9, 6, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by, his, by man shall his blood be shed, because God made him in his own image. Man is different from the rest of creation. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So all the creation is special to the Creator, but we have been given a special place. Not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your Father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. 
But of course, man says there is no law that declares the human animal to be different as seen in this broad biological perspective from any other animal. Today, the theory of evolution is an accepted fact for everyone except for the fundamentalist minority. Natural selection, the blind unconscious automatic process which Darwin discovered and which we now know is the explanation for the existence and apparently purposeful form of all life has no purpose in mind. It's so stark and dark and just awful, isn't it? So you're just the result of many random processes and mutations and happenstances. But the scripture says, the spirit of God has made me and the breath of the almighty gives me life. You formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, wonderfully your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed before me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God, how vast is the sum of them. The root meaning of the word rendered precious is weighty. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I am awake and I'm still with you. Thus says Yehovah, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am Yehovah, who made all things. Who alone stretched out the heavens and spread out the earth by myself. Who frustrates the signs of liars and makes fools of diviners who turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish. And of course, everyone will come to a realization of who Yehovah is as creator of all things. Creation and evolution in public education. While many doctrines do not raise theological objections, to the modern evolutionary synthesis as an explanation for the present form of life on earth, various fundamentalist sects, including many churches within Christ Christianity, have objected vehemently. Some adherents are passionately opposed to the consensus view of the scientific community. Literal interpretations of religious texts are the greatest cause of conflict with evolutionary and cosmological investigations and conclusions. So, literal interpretation, <laughs> that's the way it's said. Internationally, evolution is taught in science courses with limited controversy, with the exception of a few areas of the United States and several Islamic fundamentalist countries. So, you Americans, <laughs> what are you playing at? <laughs> Isaiah 66, 2. All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares Yehovah. The Lord creates all things. And then he says this wonderful thing, but this is the one to whom I will look. He was humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. This word that uh, they think we're foolish to literally like <laughs> interpret and take our truth from. And again... The two things that I think are really important. To recognize who Yehovah is, to truly get a perspective on that, and as a result, to humble yourself before him. We continue. There is the United States again. The Supreme Court has ruled the teaching of creationism as science in public schools to be unconstitutional, irrespective of how it may be pervaded in theological or religious instruction. In the United States, intelligent design has been represented as an alternative explanation to evolution in recent decades, but its demonstrably religious, cultural, and legal missions have been ruled unconstitutional by a lower court. So even to talk about intelligent design is actually, it's too close to the bone for them to even accept that. So intelligent design, eh? terrifying stuff, terrifying. You've no idea of how dangerous it is. Intelligent design, the new creationism, threatens all of science and society. <laughs> it's a bit over the top. <laughs> now, the results of encouraging the adaption of the theory of evolution is fact. 
And we've looked at these two years ago. <clears throat> Only 9% of UK respondents said humans and other living things were created by God and have always existed in their current form. 9%. Meanwhile, 19% of UK atheists believe evolution cannot explain the existence of humanity. So a few of them recognize what's a bit of a rubbish theory. According to the Times, the number of Brits believing in creation is down 50% in the past eight years. So, increasingly, increasingly, people moving away from the truth and giving Yehovah the glory that he deserves. UK adults showed the highest levels of ease in accepting evolutionary science in reference to their personal beliefs, with 64% saying they found it very easy, easy or somewhat easy, in comparison to 50% in Canada. So 64% just said, yeah, oh yeah, a theory of evolution, spot on, yeah, totally, we're, we're on board with that. It is a good thing for us to acknowledge that he is the creator of all things when we speak of him. To tell of all his wondrous works. Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Then we come to this, they are without excuse. Scripture tells us that men by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. The truth, the truth, sanctify them in your truth, your word is truth. What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor, glorify him as God or give thanks to him but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. As I say, when I'm reading through a lot of this stuff, there is a darkness to it and it's awful. They did not give him glory or thanks. 1 Timothy 6. Oh, Timothy, keep what is that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called. Some professing of ad concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. And they became futile in their thinking. The foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images representing mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creation rather than the Creator who was blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. To nature. The men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. So that's quite a, a little bit of scripture, isn't it? Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and went and worshipped and served the creation rather than the creator, we have all this, the Lord gave them up to all this perversity. And we look at the figures of all these people who don't want to recognize Yehovah as creator, 64% in the UK or whatever it was. And, and we see in our societies all kinds of perversity just growing. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. They did not see fit to acknowledge God. They did not glorify him as God or give him thanks. They became futile in their thinking. The foolish hearts were darkened, leading to all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. We see all the symptoms in abundance, don't we? Gossips are full of envy. 
disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. What an incredible description of society. And the Lord says they are without excuse. It's clear in what I have created. His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. But they did not see fit to acknowledge God. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creation, the creature rather than the creator. And of course we see this becoming more and more prevalent, um, especially with all this move towards the saving the planet and stuff. But all the spirituality behind it is really quite dark too. Jeremiah ten eleven. And thus you shall say to them, the gods that did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. And of course, <coughs> all these false gods that people go after, um, they will perish. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to look after the world. It's beautiful and creation is wonderful and all this. But um, people just lose all perspective. They lose sight of their place in creation. They lose sight of who the creator is. They exchange the truth about God for a lie. And so, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. But those who have the truth are blessed. And the truth is given to us in His Word. There we have it. Righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is the truth. And of all these unrighteous people who want to suppress it. The word of Yehovah is upright. All his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of Yehovah. It's funny, isn't it, when you read all about the way creation operates and the animals waiting for the Lord to feed them and all these things and most of creation has a, an appreciation of who Yehovah is. But then we have the unrighteousness, the unrighteous ones who want to suppress the truth. By the word of Yehovah, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap, he puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the inhabitants, uh, let all the earth fear Yehovah. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Why? Because he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. And people should just be like, wow, look what he has done. Yehovah brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people. The counsel of Yehovah stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is Yehovah, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Jehovah looks down from heaven, he sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army, a warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. By its great might it cannot rescue. Behold the eye of Jehovah is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love. <coughs> that he may deliver their soul from death <coughs> and keep them alive in famine. And again, our soul waits for Yehovah. He is our help and our shield. And we saw before, to wait on him is to seek him. To seek him is to turn to him, which is to repent, which is to humble yourself before him. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And I will be found by you, declares Yehovah. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all nations and all places where I have driven you, declares Yehovah, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Marvelous promise. Now back to Psalm 33. Our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. We know who he is. We know what his character is like. Character his attributes is laid out in his word. Let your steadfast love, O Yehovah, be upon us even as we hope in you. 
So, to trust in his holy name. Alex Stoley, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day I will bless thee and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is Yehovah and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. His holy name. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. I will trust in his holy name. This is who he is. The Lord is good to all and his compassion is over all that he has made. All thy works shall praise thee, O Jehovah, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious, glorious majesty of his kingdom. Again, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. He spoke and it came to be, he commanded, and it stood firm. But do the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Yehovah? Here we go, creation and evolution again in public education. Council of Europe. Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, Resolution 1580 from 2007. The Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe adopted its resolution titled The Dangers of Creationism in Education. The resolution observed that the war on the theory of evolution and on its proponents most often originates in forms of religious extremism closely linked to extreme right-wing political movements and adds member states firmly oppose the teaching of creationism as a scientific discipline on an equal footing with the theory of evolution and in general the presentation of creationist ideas in any discipline other than religion. So it's actually seen as something dangerous. Drafting and adoption. The, the Assembly's work leading to adopting the resolution began in 2006 when several delegates of the Assembly, led by the British Labour Party politician Andrew McIntosh, suggested to adopt a recommendation on this theme. During draft, the report and draft resolution were prepared by the delegate from the French Socialist Party, Guy Legang, Le whatever his name is. But <coughs> this was something that took a long time to prepare. A lot of people were involved in it. And the content, the resolution's aim is to warn against certain tendencies to pass off as a belief of science. The Parliamentary Assembly is worried about the possible ill effect of the spread of creationist ideas within our educational systems and about the consequences for our democracies. I just think it's fascinating that the, um, they seem to be so concerned. If we're not careful, creationism could become a threat to human rights. I don't really understand where they're coming from, to be honest. It rejects that creationism in any form, including intelligent design, can be considered scientific, um, but considers possible its inclusion in religion and cultural classes. Now, I know, I've met a couple of them actually, people who are scientists who actually um, teach creationism, but they do it in a very scientific way. So I don't understand any of this at all. But uh, they genuinely seem to be quite concerned. The resolution concludes that teaching creationism in school as a scientific theory may threaten civil rights. It's just, I don't understand. Psalm 19. <clears throat> the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanses declaring the work of his hands. They're going on in these big meetings and everything. It just makes me laugh that above them are the heavens just declaring that God is magnificent. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars, the one who leads forth the host by number. He calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. And there they are, just totally unaware. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. All the inhabitants of the world stand in order of him. He spoke and it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm. But what about in Australia? 
Although creationist views are popular among religious education teachers and creationist teaching materials have been distrib distributed by volunteers in some schools, many Australian scientists take an aggressive stance supporting the right of teachers to teach the theory of evolution unhindered by religious restrictions. So they take an aggressive stance. An essential element in the teaching of science is the encouragement of students and teachers to critically appraise the evidence for notions being taught as science. Again, the people that I have met and listened to um, are not talking gobbledygook. The society states unequivocally that the dogmatic teaching of notions such as creationism within a science curriculum stifles the development of critical thinking patterns in the developing mind and seriously compromises the best interests of objective public education. This could eventually hamper the advancements of science and technology as students take their places as leaders of future generations. It's just, it's like, we'll have no debate. <laughs> No, thank you. And that's the Geological Society of Australia. Amos 4. Behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the, the wind and declares to man what are his thoughts. He who makes dawn into darkness and treads on the high places of the earth. Yehovah, the God of hosts, is his name. And <laughs> how blessed we are to know him as creator. In Brazil, teaching of creationism in scientific education classes is forbidden by the Ministry of Education. Religious education is not forbidden as such, but the federal constitution states that the union can neither impose nor promote nor finance any religion because, by law, Brazil is a secular state. In 2004, however, teachers of religious education classes in schools of the education department of Rio de Janeiro began to present creationism in their classes as scientific fact. The practice was directly initiated by politicians in power who were promoting their personal religious views and their action moved Brazilian scientists to protest the abuse. This was abuse, apparently. In China, evolutionary theory is part of the public education in the People's Republic of China. As private religious schools are rare, nearly all students receiving primary and secondary education in mainland China uh, receive education that includes evolutionary theory. Jeremiah 10. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. When he utters his voice, there is a tumult of waters in the heavens, and he makes the mist rise from the ends of the earth. That is our God, Jehovah. He makes lightning for the rain, and he brings forth the wind from his storehouses tell of all his wondrous works. The Netherlands. In the Netherlands, some factions teach creationism in their own schools besides evolution. Factions. <laughs> in May 2005, a discussion on intelligent design erupted when Minister of Education Maria van der Hoven suggested that debate about intelligent design might encourage discourse between the country's various religious groups. She sought to stimulate an academic debate on the subject. Following strong objection from some scientists, she dropped plans of holding a conference on the matter. We cannot have this academic debate. Thank you very much. After the 2007 election, she was succeeded by Ronald Plastek, it's a funny name, isn't it? Described as molecular geneticist, staunch atheist, and opponent of intelligent design. So some factions teach creationism in their own schools besides evolution. I'm just so mindful of the language that's being used. A faction. They're a faction, are they? Okay. Norway, 86. Norway's then Minister of Church and Education Affairs, Kjell Magnix Bondovic, whatever his name is, proposed new education plans for the elementary and middle school levels, which included skepticism to the theory of evolution and were told that a final answer to the origin of mankind was unknown. Sounds fair, doesn't it? The proposal was withdrawn after it had generated controversy. Ooh. Not all the inhabitants of the world stand at order. He spoke again to be commanded and it stood firm. How far away have people moved from the truth? Pakistan, although it has been claimed that evolution is not taught in Pakistani universities, the Higher Education Commission of Pakistan, which is the federal body which sets standards of course content, 
as knowledge and understanding of evolution is being compulsory for several courses, such as microbiology, bioinformatics, zoology, botany, as well as others. 2006, the Pakistani Academy of Sciences became a signatory of the Inter-Academy Panel Statements on the Teaching of Evolution. And many of the contemporary titles on the creation evolution controversy, such as those by biologist Richard Dawkins, are available for general sale. Hurrah! That's good news then, isn't it? You alone uh, are Yehovah. You've made the heavens, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them and the heavenly host bows down before you. But in Poland, Poland saw a controversy over creationism in 2006 when Deputy Education Minister Miroslav Orszakowski denounced evolution as a lie taught in public, uh, Polish schools. His superior minister of national education, Roman Giertych, has stated that the theory of evolution would continue to be taught in Polish schools as long as most scientists in our country say that it is the right theory. And Geertrich's father, member of the European Parliamentary um, Parliament, Magic Geertrich, has, however, opposed the teaching of evolution and has claimed that in every culture there are indications that we remember dinosaurs, the Scots of Nessie, we Poles have the Wavel Dragon. There are opposition um, to just this... Stonewall, teach the theory of evolution, teach the theory of evolution, but all the time they come up against this opposition. In 2006 in Russia, a schoolgirl in St. Petersburg, Russia, and her father took the issue of the teaching of evolution in Russian schools to court. The Russian Ministry of Education supports the theory of evolution, and representatives of the Russian Orthodox Church backed the suit. The suit. In 2007, the first instance court, and in July, the second instance court ruled in favour of the ministry. So, again, opposition comes, but no, the theory of evolution, that's where we stand. The Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth by understanding he established the heavens. And, of course, it seems that these people do not have wisdom or understanding. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse. And I just feel sorry for so many people who've been completely deluded. They're missing out on so much. When you can look at creation from the perspective of Yehovah being the creator, it's an amazing thing, isn't it? It's so wonderful. And you just have such an appreciation for what he has made. Serbia. In Serbia, the teaching of evolution was suspended for one week in 2004 under Minister of Education and Sports, Kolik, only allowing schools to reintroduce, ev reintroduce evolution into the curriculum if they also taught creationism. After a deluge of protest from scientists, teachers and opposition parties, says the BBC report, Kolik's deputy, Milan Breda, made the statement, I have come here to confirm Charles Darwin is still alive and announced that the decision was reversed. Hurrah, eh? They're all made up. After this, Kolik resigned, so the government said that she had caused problems that had started to reflect on the work of the entire government. <laughs> That's just bizarre to me. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him, and they don't, do they? He spoke and it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm. And they can't appreciate any of this. So, we finish with the United Kingdom and then we'll have a look at the, uh, the United States. In each of the countries of the United Kingdom, there is an agreed syllabus for religious education with the right of parents to withdraw their children from these lessons. The religious education syllabus does not involve teaching creationism, but rather teaching the central tenets of major world faiths. So, we won't get taught about Yehovah, the creator in religious education in England. At the same time, the teaching of evolution is compulsory in public funded schools. Of course, the host of heaven worships Yehovah. These people don't seem to want to. You are Yehovah, you alone, you've made the heaven, the heaven of heavens with all the hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them. 
the host of heaven worships you. In 2003, the Emmanuel Schools Foundation, previously the Vardy Foundation after its founder, sponsored a number of faith-based academies where evolution and creationist ideas were taught side by side in science classes. This caused a considerable amount of controversy. The former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, has expressed his view that creationism, there he is, should not be taught in schools. I don't understand. By him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And here we have the Archbishop of Canterbury saying that creationism should not be taught in schools. An organization called Truth in Science has distributed teaching packs of creationist information to schools and claims that 59 schools are using the packs as a useful classroom resource. The government has stated that neither intelligent design nor creationism are recognized scientific theories and they are not included in the science curriculum. The Truth in Science Information Pack is therefore not an appropriate resource to support the science curriculum. It is arranging to communicate this message directly to schools. The teaching of creationism and intelligent design in the schools in the UK is being opposed uh, by the British Centre for Science Education. So. Everywhere you go, all around the world, people um, don't seem to be taught at all about creation, about Jehovah as the creator of all things. And people who suggest that it should even be part of a debate are just shot down because it's dangerous. Factions. We read, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. How far we've come for he spoke, it came to be, he commanded, and it stood firm. So what about America? Main article, creation and evolution in public education in the United States. In the United States, creationists and proponents of evolution are engaged in a long-standing battle over the legal status of creation and evolution in the public school classroom. Some 13 U.S. states are exposed to offer exposed They've been exposed oh, to offer procreationist contents in public or charter schools, and they are often, uh, and they often are criticised as unconstitutional. There are also religious homeschool curriculum that offer creationist education. Ooh, homeschoolers. Ooh. <laughs> so some 13 U.S. states are exposed to offer procreationist uh, contents. Terrifying stuff again. Terrifying. The world over, there is incredible opposition to the truth. Man refusing to give glory to Jehovah. So, some of the things we've read. Literal interpretations of religious texts are the greatest cause of conflict with evolutionary and cosmological investigations and conclusions. The war on the theory of evolution and its proponents most often originates in forms of religious extremism. If we're not careful, creationism could become a threat to human rights. Factions, some factions teach creationism in their own schools besides evolution. You get the flavor, don't you? Claiming to be wise, they became fools. They became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts were darkened. They did not glorify him as God or give thanks to him. By their unrighteousness, they suppressed the truth. They are without excuse. Yet for us, there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. And one Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach, by whom all things, uh, and we exist through him. By whom are all things, and we exist through him. John 1, 3. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Because worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they, were, they existed and were created. He says, I won't give me glory to no other. So Yehovah is worthy of praise from all his creation. Psalm 148. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights. Praise him, all the angels, praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. 
Let them praise the name of Jehovah, for He commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. Praise Jehovah from the earth, you great sea creatures and all deeps. I'll leave that up for a minute because there's so many bizarre looking things there, isn't there? Look at the sea sponge. <laughs> What's going on there? And look at the teeth on the trigger fish. And the red hand fish. <laughs> oh, Fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds. Who'd have thought a little, is it a grasshopper, would look so incredible? Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth. Young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of Jehovah, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise Jehovah. For people who are watching online, this is the children from the fellowship. From the day when we went and uh, we kept the Feast of Trumpets. They always climb up on a bit of rock around here, so I've got a picture. So the question is, will you glorify and honor Jehovah and give thanks and praise to him? Back to the song of David. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek Jehovah rejoice. So those who seek him, who are they? Those who repent, those who wait for him and trust in his word. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. And later in the song, sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is Jehovah and greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless, whether they be gods of bogus science or flesh scented spirituality. But Jehovah made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him, strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to Jehovah, O families of the peoples, ascribe to Jehovah glory and strength. Ascribe to Jehovah the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship Jehovah in the splendor of holiness. So worship here, Shaka, to bow, to prostrate oneself. Speaks of humility coming before Jehovah as a servant would come before his master. It says here, bring an offering, draw near, Karav Koban. Same as in James, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, purify your hearts, you double-minded. We know what the offerings are. We've been through them. All begins with complete surrender, the Ola. When you recognize the true perspective of who Yehovah is, he's the creator of all things. Surely to humble yourself before him is the only thing that you can do. And the Ola is a whole offering. The word, comes, uh, the word comes from the Hebrew kalil. The root of this word is kalal, which means to be perfected, finished, or complete. This is talking about completely surrendering yourself to Yehovah. And one of the cognates of this word is kalat, which is the word for bride. If you are completely surrendered, then you are Yehovah's. For Yehovah, you know, for your maker is your husband. Yehovah Zavayot is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The God of the whole earth. He is called. So, finish with this. Will you recognize who he is and bow before him surrendered? Will you ascribe to him glory and esteem? Now, at the beginning of part one, I mentioned something that, but it didn't go out in the live stream and it wasn't recorded or anything. So I'm going to mention it again now. Um, and it's... What probably everybody is aware of, and it is, or most people are aware of, is the sad news that um, Rob Skiba passed away um, this week. And I know it's made a lot of greatly saddened a lot of people. And it is really sad news. Um, I know he had an effect, a big effect on lots of people's lives, and um, was instrumental in leading them to the truth. So our thoughts are with his family, and particularly with his wife, Sheila. I got to meet him and he was lovely and um, he was very encouraging and he was very good to me and JP and he shared our videos and we're, we're very grateful. Um, I thought a lot of him. So yeah, I thought 
I'd mention that. So, yeah. um, there we go. Better sheet part two. <coughs> there we go. Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us sing to Jehovah. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful news, noise to him with songs of praise. For Jehovah is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship. And the word there is this word, shikah, to bow, to prostrate oneself, and bow down, to bend, to bow down, to kneel. Let us kneel. And the word there is barach, which means to bless, before Yehovah, our maker. So let us humble ourselves before our creator, is what's being spoken of. To worship Yehovah is to be submitted to him and is to be humble, to lessen yourself become more like him. To bless Jehovah is to be submitted to him, to be humble, to surrender completely to him. For he is our God and we are the sheep of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. So how does that work for us? John 10. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. The sheep follow him for they know his voice. They walk after him. Strangers they don't go after. They will not follow, but they will flee from, but they do not know the voice of strangers. This is all about bowing down before Jehovah, about being humble before him. Sadly, many people claiming to be, belong to the good shepherd have little interest in hearing his voice. Their lives are not defined by walking in the truth and keeping the commandments and the statutes. The standards and rules they live by are, by, are of man either be their own ideas or adopted ideas from other men or religious institutions. But to follow Yeshua means total surrender. When we talk about Yehovah as creator of all things, um, an understanding and that surely can only bring one response when we realize what, it, what a fool it would be to contend with him. The only response, really, when you recognize who he is, is to completely surrender and to follow Yeshua. This is what it is all about. It's about laying down your life, dying to self. We become less so that he becomes more. True repentance is turning from going your own way and going Yehovah's ways. Yeshua. He said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. This is all about dying to self. But if you want to hold on to that life, go ahead, but you will lose life. You will lose the life that Yeshua is offering. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Again, we begin with songs of praise to Yehovah. In our understanding of who he is, there should be incredible gratitude, especially for us who know the truth. You consider all the people in the world striving around, going after all crazy nonsense. And yet we are so blessed to have an understanding of who Yehovah is. They don't. But what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? And then he says this, Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. How could you be ashamed of him? No matter what opposition you come up against. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. This is um, pretty massive, isn't it? It's not, if anyone likes the sound of me, yeah, that's cool, just, you know, carry on as you are, say a few nice things about me. If anybody challenges you, you can now to cower in the corner and everything like that. No. Let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Daily, every day. 
laying down your life, dying to self that he might live. It's talking about complete surrender. Most people don't live here. Most people live in this fuzzy notion of being religious, and they'll call themselves people of God, or, yeah, the good shepherd is me shepherd. But most people don't live here in complete surrender. They might have an idea that Jehovah is the creator of all things, but somehow it hasn't sunk in, and it hasn't been established in them to have this perspective exactly of who he is, and they are not surrendered. And they don't demonstrate total obedience. But this is what Yeshua is asking for. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. To walk humbly with Jehovah is to be completely surrendered. To hear, to shema, and to follow him, to follow after his voice. Not go after another voice, but to go after him. And of course, surrender to his standards of justice to demonstrate his kindness. Because when you die to self that he might live, you become like him. And back to Psalm 95. Come, let us worship. Shika, prostrate oneself and bow down. Kneel, let us kneel. Let's bless Jehovah before Jehovah, our maker. Let us humble ourselves before our creator. To worship him is to be submitted to him. To bless Jehovah is to be submitted to him. For he is our God and we are the sheep of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah as on the day at Massah in the wilderness. When your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though it's, they had seen my work. And what did they say? Oh, is Jehovah among us or not? This is a bit tough. What's going on? For 40 years I loathed that generation and said they are people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. I do not want to have any part of Jehovah's wrath. Will you worship and bow before you make it? Or are you hard-hearted like the people just described? Today when you hear his voice's word, will you put Jehovah to the test? And will you go astray in your heart? So many people struggling with this and that in the life and all this and oh, I can't believe it. And really all it comes down to is the fact they are not surrendered to Jehovah. We should humble ourselves before Yehovah and acknowledge him as the God of all creation. And those who are humble submit to him and they walk in all his ways. And that's what he asks for, nothing less. So let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For Yehovah is a great God and a great king above all gods. There should be great gratitude. Song for the Sabbath. It is good to give thanks to Jehovah, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. An ongoing thankfulness. Upon an instrument of ten strings, upon the psaltery, upon the harm, with a solemn sound, or other translations, to the melody of the lyre, with a song on a harp. Joyful gratitude, giving him glory and honor and praise because he is worthy of all these things. For you, O Yehovah, have made me glad by your work. At the work of your hands, sing for joy. The work of your hands, we've seen his wondrous works described as part of his wondrous works as being that of creation. So I will celebrate creation and worship you, Yehovah, the creator, as opposed to I will worship creation and deny the creator, which is where many people come from. But we're told, tell of all his wondrous works. Our Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power, and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. It's another amazing thing to suddenly get a realization of. 
O Yehovah Zavayot, the God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You made heaven and earth. He's the God of absolutely everything. And yet so many people come before him stiff-necked. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you would form the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And yet people will contest with his word. The Lord says do this, but I think it might be better if I do this instead. I think I'm right in this situation. I think you got this one wrong, Lord. The Lord God of hosts, he who touches the earth and it melts and all who dwell in it mourn. And all of it rises like the Nile and sinks again like the Nile of Egypt. Who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and founds his vault upon the earth. Who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out upon the surface of the earth. Yehovah is his name. And this same God, the creator of all things, speaks to those who would come before him and bow. To all those who belong to his holy nation, he says this. Listen to me, O house of Yaakov, all the remnants of the house of Israel who have been born by me from before your birth, carried from the womb. Even to your old age, I am he, and to gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear, I will carry and will save. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be alike? Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none other. I am God and there is none like me. Declared in the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things yet not done, saying, My counsel shall stand, I will accomplish all my purpose. But Jehovah says, There's none like me. Jehovah, as the Holy One, is utterly unique, distinct, and set apart as the only one. Great is Jehovah, and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. And yet people contend with him. They might not think they do, but they do by not submitting to him and not bowing to him. And thinking to do it their way. And it's madness, it's utter madness when you start to consider who he is. And when you start to consider his nature and his character, it's utter madness to come before him with anything other than gratitude, humility, and great love for him. He's outside of time and he inhabits eternity. He is, I would say, beyond our comprehension. Truly, there is none like him. His greatness is unsearchable. And yet, he tells us that he dwells with the humble. Do you ever look up and look at the stars in the sky and stuff and think, look at all this and the Lord made all this. And he, you know, he's, he's incredible and yet, he loves me. It's mad, isn't it? So says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit. To revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite, the remorseful. Yehovah looks to those who will humble themselves before him. And many religious folk like to consider themselves as contrite. The word is, you know, remorseful. Dacha means crushed. And of lowly, humble spirit. But most have not bowed in surrender before their maker. That is why they struggle with sin. And when they're tested, they harden their hearts. They do not worship Yehovah. Because to worship him is to humble yourself before him. To be humble. To bless Jehovah is to be submitted to him.
to be humble. So the world continues on without acknowledging the Creator. And many people claiming the God of the Bible is their God go after a false God of their own vain imagination and in unrighteousness they deny Yehovah too. People creating gods that are okay with their life choices or whatever it might be or their worldview. People contending with Yehovah. People not bowing in submission to Him. But thus says Yehovah, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. This is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Yehovah, the creator of all things, says he looks to those who tremble at his word. He looks to the humble. It is only those who are surrendered to Yehovah who are humble before him that can declare with sincerity the words of David. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will extol you. Because for so many people, Yehovah is not their God. For those who doubt, bow down before Yehovah. For those who tremble at his word, we read, Our help is in the name of Yehovah, who made heaven and earth. And it, you know, hang on. Let's, who made heaven and earth. By the word of Yehovah, the heavens were made. By the breath of his mouth, all their host. So if you do get a chance, have a, go out and have a look. The counsel of Yehovah stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is Yehovah. The people whom he has chosen as his heritage. And as we have seen, he is husband to those who bow in complete surrender. For your maker is your husband, Yehovah Zavayot is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth, he is called. All begins with the Ola offering, the whole offering, from which we can get one of the cognates being Kala, which is the word for bride. So come, let us kneel before Yehovah, our maker, and bless him. Let's ascribe to him glory and esteem. And to bless him, we must be humble before him. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. <clears throat> We've said before, he's outside of time. This is a picture I won't go into the details of, but um, JP goes, I don't know what teaching it is that he goes into it on, but it's worth finding out if anyone can think what it is. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. I think he goes into detail on this on the discussion of the Trinity. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. So God saw the light that it was good. And this is before the sun and the moon were made, and it puts me in mind of the new Jerusalem. The city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the lamp. The light, the night will be no more. They will need, uh, they will, they will need no light of lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light. They will reign forever and ever. So the sun and the moon don't come along till day four. So the light we have here is spiritual light. God saw, Ra'a, understood the light that it was good. We should also Ra'a, Ra'a, understand the light to be good. Isaiah two five. We read, O house of Yaakov. Come ye, let us walk in the light of Yehovah. And to walk in the light of Yehovah is to walk according to his word. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Let me read in Isaiah 9 too. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and this is a reference to Yeshua. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. It's also a reference to the people... Um, who were in the place that in Israel that became known as the um, the land of the Gentiles because that's where the house of Israel were carried off into captivity. So those who had seen a great darkness have seen a great light. And this is Yeshua who came and preached there. Again, Yeshua spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world who follows me. 
Who, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Word is light, Yeshua is light. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. To reject the Word and dismiss it as the Lord is to dismiss the Messiah and to walk in darkness. And we've looked before at this only begotten. It means unique one. So, Yeshua, the Word made flesh. The Word is light. Yeshua is light. And for those who are Yehovah's people, a holy nation, the temple of Yehovah, the body of Messiah, we read, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Yeshua HaMashiach. So we offer spiritual sacrifices and we come back to this. And we come back to the fact that it all begins with the Ola. And we're pre priests who represent Yehovah. And we read, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. And it is Yeshua that brings us into the light. Yeshua spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And again, I mentioned it in part one. We were reading about the people who are putting across this idea that creationism is a threat and that the theory of evolution is amazing and stuff. And I said, this, it's like there's a darkness to it. And um, I was just talking with JP um, in the break. We were talking about the fact that in these institutions and in public schools and stuff, there is this great darkness, and it is the kingdom of darkness. And um, maybe trying to go in there with the gospel message and the message, that rather the message that Yehovah is the creator and stuff is um, choosing the wrong battlefield because it is the kingdom of darkness. And he likened it to trying to make white paint by starting with a tub of black paint and just adding white to it. I can see what he, what he was saying. But the Lord says this, whoever follows me, and we know what it is to follow him, it's to completely surrender, to lay everything down. will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He says, I've come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Whoever believes, okay, this word pastuo, in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son does not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Again, here we see, to him, uh, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient, so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. So when we read this, I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness, we can see that to believe is to obey. Belief, having faith and obedience is synonymous. Whoever obeys me does not remain in darkness. So there's a lot of people who think they walk in the light, but they don't because they do not obey him. And the psalmist says, it is you who light my lamp. Yehovah, my God, lightens my darkness. You can put your trust in false gods. You can create a God of your own vain imagination. But you will still be in the dark. He says, whoever will follow me will not walk in darkness, will have the light of life. He said to his disciples, if anyone will come after, him, uh, after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. This, isn't, this is not taken on board by many people at all. So many people who claim to be Jesus's, claim to be Yeshua's, who claim to be walking in the light, who claim to have the promise of life eternal. It's just completely lost what Yeshua is saying here. Don't let it be lost on you. Whoever would save his life 
will lose it. And that's the problem with so many people. They don't want to let go of the life that they've got, that they just just like, oh, I'm not going to, I can't, I can't send me back on that and this. Yeshua says, whoever loses his life, dies to self, lays it down for him, he will find life. Whoever will lay down his life in complete surrender his life, whoever is humble will have, will have life. Again, we come back to this idea of bringing the offering and the ola, which is completely surrendering. Romans 12, 1, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. At one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. The fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Romans 8 says this. The mind that is set in the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Okay, this is talking about stiff-necked, not humbling yourself. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who are in the flesh are in darkness. They don't have the light of life. Those who refuse to surrender and walk in accordance with Yehovah's teaching and instruction cannot please Yehovah. They are not children of the light. Walk as children of light. For the commandment is a lamp and the Lord is light and reproofs of instruction of the way of life. Walk as children of the light. Walk according to the word. I can, I can say for definite that I recognize a part of my life when I was walking in darkness, when I was not surrendered to Yehovah to walk in his word. And the difference is unbelievable. When I found out about his commandments still standing, it was just an amazing, an amazing thing. And um The contrast is just incredible, and I'm sure there's lots of people here and lots of people watching it who can testify to the same thing. That um, when you look back at your past, you can see, wow, you can almost, it's like it's just covered in a horrible darkness. And I remember feeling it at the time as well, and not enjoying it. This is the message we have heard from him and we claim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. And the truth, of course, is his word. To walk in the darkness is to walk contrary to Yehovah's word. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Yeshua, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So if we walk in the light, that is, if we walk in accordance with his word, then we can be cleansed of all sin. To walk in the light, the Torah, is to truly have repented. Right, what is sin? Whoever commits sin transgresses also the, the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. To repent of sin is to turn from sin to stop sinning. It is to bow to Yehovah. It is to be humble. To offer yourself as a living sacrifice. To walk in the light speaks of drawing near to Yehovah, with the spiritual sacrifices, and it all begins with the Ola, which is complete and utter surrender. And I would say to anybody <coughs> who's kidded themselves, anybody who's wrestling with sin in their life and justifying this, that, and the other, and thinking that it's all okay, then you have to really ask yourself, have you truly surrendered to Jehovah or not? This is where we should be. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, which, as we've seen, leads to obedience in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Faith synonymous with obedience, which is synonymous with complete surrender. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. And behold, the new has come. Speaks of dying to self. Speaks of picking up your cross daily. To walk in the light speaks of true repentance. It speaks of following Yeshua, picking up your cross, laying down your life in total surrender. And it is these people who please Yehovah. They have their sins cleansed. They have life. And these people shine. Now, 
Um, <clears throat> just over the last few weeks, um, I live, for people who don't know, I live with me mum and dad. Um, and me brother. Um, and the Dudex came and visited at me mum and dad's house. And my mum and dad got to meet them. And um, this whole thing about light and shining and all this, um, they were really bowled over by them as a family. And so much so that they said, we would l before you go back to America, we want to take you out for a meal. And um, before they left, they said, make sure they know that we were very impressed by them. Um, we think they're lovely people on a, on a lovely family. And um, subsequently, I've had Keith and Brandon staying at my mum and dad's house. And again, shining and standing out and making an impression, which is what we're called to do, to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And how do we do it? By being people who are completely surrendered so that we can shine in a world that is full of darkness. Now all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And Paul continues, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So scripture equips us for every good work. The word equips us. Yeshua said to us, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. It's the word that equips us for these good words. And give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The word equips us to shine and draw men to the light. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. What a job we've been given to represent the Messiah. To come before people and declare to them who Yehovah is. Yeshua appears to Saul, Acts 26. I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Yeshua whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you've seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. Delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to who I'm sending you. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. Why? So that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. If you want to receive forgiveness and a place amongst those who are Yeshua's, then walk in the light. We're called like Paul, to be a light to the lost. So the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. It's always been that Jehovah's plan that we should be a light for the lost. I, Jehovah, have called you in righteousness. I will hold your hand. I will keep you and I will give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations. Now, those drawn to the light, they repent. To repent is to turn from darkness to light. To walk in the light is to practice the truth, the Torah. Then we will have turned from the power of Satan to God. And we saw with Paul in Acts 26. Turn from darkness to light and the power of Satan to God. We will have received the forgiveness of sins. Okay? If we walk in the light, the blood of Yeshua cleanses us from all sin. Those who are not of uh, those who are of the world, rather, are not drawn to the light. They remain in the power of Satan. We read, the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Those who are of the world, not drawn to the light, is mentioned in John 3. This is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. 
because their deeds were evil. Everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. So don't be surprised that the world doesn't like the light. Don't be surprised that the world doesn't like you. Okay. He who does the truth walks in the ways of Jehovah, comes to the light. Yeshua spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. And whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness is blind in his eyes, which is a call to love one another. God called the light day in the darkness. He called night in the evening and the morning of the first day. Again, this is before the sun and moon came to be. But we know there is a spiritual connotation to the day and night. 1 Thessalonians 5. You're not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. You are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. Colossians 1. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Children of the light of the day walk in the world and they bring glory to God. They stand out and they shine and they really do. And you might think sometimes that you don't get noticed, that you're not really shining that brightly. But if you are surrendered to Jehovah and you walk in his ways, you shine and you bring glory to Jehovah. I think that is incredible. In a world where we've seen they don't want to acknowledge him as created, they don't want to give glory to him. He's a threat. The idea of, oh, Danny Marica is a big threat, and we can bring glory to his name by walking in his ways. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and so it was. And God called the firmament in heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And the heavens, as we've seen, declare and proclaim his righteousness. All the people see his glory. And I come to just mention quickly, even in the morning of the second day, which is why, um, one of the reasons why we start our days in the evening and go to the next evening, and that's how we count. Well, the word for ferment is rakia, the vault of heaven, extended service, expanse, um, bronze mirror, cast bronze, hard as cast metal um, mirror. So seen as this hard um, thing up in the sky. This is the ancient Hebrew conception of the universe. Seen here as well. well as you can see, the firmament is this hard structure in the sky. Um, there's another rendering of it. God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters. He called seas and God saw that it was good. God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree uh, yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after its kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. So life comes along on the third day, which is interesting. All throughout Torah, we see pointers to the Messiah. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs of the seasons, or Moedim, for days and for years. And I point you to these two teachings here. Um, about the calendar. And let them be for lights in the firmaments of the heavens to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the, star, uh, the stars also, talking about the sun and the moon, obviously. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and morning were the fourth day. 
So if God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, coming back to this um, picture of creation. God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that had life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales in every living creature that moves, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image, which we looked at before, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. But apparently man's just nothing special. He's just like everything else. So God said, let us make man in our image. Who are the us? The verbs surrounding us are third person, masculine, singular. What we have here is what is known as the plural of majesty. Elohim is the plural of Eloah. It can refer to gods, but often in Scripture, it's referring to Yehovah, singular, but denoted as a plural to stress his greatness. The us, as denoted by the verbs, is singular, just as Elohim, which is a plural, is also singular. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, uh, he created him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Please note, be fruitful and multiply is a blessing, not a command. And I've actually seen or met people who've used it as an excuse to be promiscuous, which is crazy, isn't it? One person in particular who'd been to Bible college, which was a bit odd. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree-yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. To every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the earth and to everything that creeps upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Jehovah gave us so much, how incredibly blessed we are. There is so many things in creation, isn't there, that are just like mind-bogglingly good. I mean, I always come back to things like strawberries being amazing and bananas and things like that. And just what we've talked before about all the spices and herbs and when you put them together and the amazing tastes and the, the pleasure it brings. But also when you look at the way the Lord's created things that are just pleasing to your eye and actually... Make you feel like, wow, really, really good inside. Now Psalm 8 comes to mind. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, why is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. It's one for all them scientists who say that he's not much of a thing at all. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. So Yehovah has given us such an incredible privilege. But will we ascribe to him glory and give him thanks? And we come to the Sabbath. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all of the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So pretty clear, it's the seventh day. Yeah, it's the seventh day, it's the seventh day. And the seventh day has always been Saturday. Even though people go to church on a Sunday. Oh, very bizarre. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the heavens, the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew. For Jehovah God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. 
But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And Jehovah God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And Jehovah God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also is in the midst of the garden. Please take note of this. The tree of life is in the midst of the garden. And then as an add-on, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It seems like the tree of life got prime place. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Python, that is which compasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good, there is bdellium and the onyx stone. The name of the second river is Gihon, the same that, that is compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third is Hidachel, uh, that which goes towards the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the word there is to shimar it, to tend, to protect it, to watch over it, to defend it of all costs, to cherish it. And just as Adam was told to shimar the garden, it's the same thing we're told to do with Jehovah's commandments, shimar them. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it, thereof you shall surely die. The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone, and I will make him a help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. Please note, Adam was invited to get involved. He didn't have to pray about every animal and what he should name them. Jehovah gave him and us a brain and invites us to express ourselves. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought it unto the man. Now, in Hebrew, what was taken out of Adam was zelah. Usually that is translated side and not rib, which is interesting. Hebrew noun is derived from a verb root, which means to limp. One limps because he has a stronger side and a weaker side. The essence then of what was taken out of Adam was that pertaining to his weaker side. I would say that <laughs> people get annoyed by that. It's probably more that they were not totally balanced. So in other words, they're different. A woman and a man are different, aren't they? And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, Ish Shah, because she was taken out of man, Ish they're the Hebrew words being used. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. They were both naked in the manner of his wife and they were not ashamed. So Adam and man and woman. Adam, the name for man, comes from the Hebrew word Adamah, the ground from whence he came. In Genesis 2.23 we have the introduction of woman. And Adam calls woman Isha. Until this point, every time man is mentioned in Scripture, the word Adam is used. From here on him, we have the word Ish for man. So Ish and Ish are relationship words. They are tied together. You can't have one without the other. The identity of Adam, as it were, is changed because of the woman, because of the relationship. And those who are surrendered to Yehovah, who are humble before him, can declare with sincerity the words of David. You are my God, I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. There is relationship. There is a relationship that changes your identity. Remember, to follow Yeshua means total surrender. Laying down your life, dying to self. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. This is obviously talking about another relationship that causes change in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. 
I've been crucified. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Again, a relationship that brings change. And it's talking about here the faith that is synonymous with obedience, with complete surrender. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Again, there is change because of the relationship. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Die into self, picking up your cross daily. The thing is, there's so many people who claim to have relationships with Yehovah, and there is no change, is there? As we have seen, he is husband to those who bow in complete surrender. Your maker is your husband. There is relationship, strong relationship. Yehovah Zavayot is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. But of course, the relationship is with those who come before him in complete surrender. Our identity is changed because of the relationship. But many folk like to claim they have a relationship with Yehovah. But most have not bowed in surrender before they make it. They may label themselves as his people. Their identity may well be tied up in religious practices, but it is not changed by relationship with Yehovah. Most claiming relationship with Yehovah go on much as the people in the world do, and they are not conformed to the image of the Messiah. O oh, come, let us sing to Yehovah. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For Yehovah is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are all the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship. Come, let us what? Prostrate ourselves and bow down. Kneel before him. And the word used for kneel here is barak. Let us bless him. Let us bless Yehovah, our maker. Let us humble ourselves before our creator. He is our God. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And when we do that and we come before him in complete humility and the relationship exists, we are transformed. We are changed. So come let us kneel before Yehovah, our maker, and bless him. It's better sheep, part three, the fall. Here we have the introduction of the serpent, Nakash. Hebrew word Nakash is the noun form of a Hebrew verb meaning to hiss or to whisper. And the verb can also, by implication, mean to practice enchantment, to use sorcery, to augur or divine. We read, now the serpent was more subtle, Aram, naked, than any other beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So the serpent focuses Eve um, what she doesn't have. As God, uh, yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So effectively. So I heard this command. Did Jehovah really tell you that you can't have from any of the trees in the garden? which is, of course, not what Yehovah said. He pretty much said the opposite. The serpent takes the negative approach, focusing not on the vast array of options for food Yehovah gave Adam, but on the sole and simple exception. Also notice that in 2.16, it says that Yehovah actually commanded the man, but the serpent lessens the Creator's words by asking if God Elohim had said. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the, tree, uh, of the fruit of the trees of the garden. She actually downplays what they can eat of. She says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees as opposed to what was actually stated. We may eat of all the trees. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So, Jehovah had not decreed that man should not touch that fruit. Why then did Eve feel that she had to add to Jehovah's instruction? As soon as you deviate from Jehovah's word, you're in trouble. If you add or take away or try to twist it, then it will not go well for you. So the serpent knows that she's not speaking with the authority of Jehovah. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall, surely, you shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. 
And uh, we, we pointed this out before, but for anybody who's new to this, the serpent didn't actually lie. He deceived Eve with the truth. For a start, the following statement was not a lie. You should be as gods, knowing good and evil. This is confirmed by Yehovah later. Yehovah God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. In the English translation, the serpent appears to lie, but the Hebrew is more revealing. Genesis 2.17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Surely die there is mot tamut. And now, Genesis 3, 3, we'll be looking at the serpent. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. This is what Eve is relating to. Him. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And die there is tamutu. So we have two types of death mentioned, mot tamut and tamutu. Genesis 3, 4, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. And that is lo mot tamutu. The serpent does not lie. He just tells Eve that she will not die in the sense that she expressed it. Temutu. Yehovah said that she would surely um, mot tamut. Not temutu. He uses the truth to deceive her. We see how these um, two types of death are identified in Scripture. In 1 Samuel 14, 44, Saul said... God, so do to me, uh, and more also, you shall surely die, Jonathan. And this die here is mot to moot, and it's a reference to physical death, as is evident from the context of the text. Another example is found in 2 Kings 1, 4. Um, and in Isaiah 22, 14, we see, Yehovah Zavayot has revealed himself in my ears. Surely this iniquity will not be atoned for until you die, says the Lord God of hosts. And that is Temu 2. And again, from the context, we see that this the word clearly refers to is spiritual death. So the serpent doesn't like. Instead, he uses the truth to deceive. And given that the truth is the word, we can see that right from the beginning, the serpent has been seeking to deceive man by twisting the word, just altering it. The serpent deceives with the truth. It reminds me of this verse. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. So they will come carrying his name um, in vain and falsely. They will declare that Yeshua, uh, Jesus, is the Messiah, but they will go on to lead many astray with ear tickling and the doctrines of demons. Um, <coughs> we've all seen it. We all know there's a vast number of people who've been completely led astray. They've had the word completely contorted and twisted to remarkable um, degrees. And as a result, indeed, many are led astray. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So what we have here is a twisting of the word, this being led by desire, and we have a focus on what is off limits rather than on the amazing abundance that Yehovah has provided. Please note that earlier we read that Yehovah placed the tree of life in the midst of the garden. Genesis 2. Yehovah God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made Yehovah God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the Hebrew, it is only clear that it is the tree of life that is in the midst of the garden. So it's tree of life in the midst and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's not clear where the tree of knowledge of good and evil is. So according to Yehovah, it is the tree of life that is in the midst of the garden. But what does Eve say? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So to Yehovah, the focus is the tree of life. That's what's in the midst of the garden. But to Eve, the focus is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Either 
Eve misidentifies the tree that she's not supposed to eat from and thinks that it is the tree of life that's off limits, the one that Jehovah says is in the midst of the garden. Or from her perspective, it is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that is her focus. The, the way that the scripture works, um, there's no like just lazy putting together of words. Words are put together um, to teach things that it's all perfectly constructed. It's not just by happenstance. The fact that Jehovah mentions the tree of life in the midst of the garden and she mentions that it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden, I think speaks to a lot to us about Eve's perspective. To her, it is this tree of the knowledge of good and evil that is her focus. To her, it is this tree that is in the midst of the garden. So the fall here is a picture of the way many people claiming to be Yehovah's people fall. Because as we know... Um, <laughs> What we see after this is given to a husband, they fall and they get exiled. So many people fall. Why? Because their focus is not on the abundance of what Yehovah has blessed them with. They tend to focus on what leads to death, on things that Yehovah might say are off limits. I don't know, take an example. Can't have sex before marriage. And some people, that's all they'll focus about. Oh, no, no. And they focus on things which lead to death. Instead of a grateful heart fixed upon Yehovah, that is a heart led by desire. But I really want this. This is what I want. Instead of keeping their eyes fixed on Yehovah, completely surrendered to Him. And if you throw in a little twist into the word, you pretty much have a full recipe for, desi for disaster. Because when people want something and want to be led by desire... They're quite happy to accept a little bit of twisting of the word, not too ready to examine the truth behind it. There you have your recipe for disaster. It is interesting to note that the account of the fall includes adding to the word and twisting it. The serpent uses the word to tempt Eve into sinning. We also see the same approach with Yeshua in the wilderness. Just before his ministry, <coughs> Yeshua was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came and said to him, If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So when temptation comes, it is good to be able to turn to the word. Not a distorted version of the word, but what the word actually says. Often the enemy comes trying to get you to fall by misapplying the word. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. as a good example of it. And said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. <coughs> How many people do we know? who are happy to take Scripture out of context and to use it to justify walking contrary to Jehovah's ways. Yeshua said to him, though, no, because he knew the word, he said, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you'll fall down and worship me. Yeshua said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. The devil left him, and behold, the angels came and were ministering to him. Resist the devil, and he will flee. What does he combat? That's the time with the truth, the word. And what does he say? You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. The word there is proskuneo. And we see this reverence is effectively what it's talking about. To kiss, it's all to do with, again, um, bowing down to fall upon the knees with the forehead to the ground. We see here, <clears throat> like a dog licking his master's hand to fawn or crouch, to prostrate oneself in homage, to adore and to worship. This is Yehovah that we are to bow before and to serve, to come humbly before in complete surrender. Now, it does not surprise me when I see the enemy trying to lead people astray by lead, appealing to the desires, desires and using the word to offer them justification. 
and it seems like <clears throat> I mean, I'm often unaware, and I'll hear of like crazy doctrines that keep popping up, and people really like love them, and they get in, oh yeah, and they get so involved in them and stuff, and it always just confuses me. But we see often that the truth gets twisted, and people wind up in bondage to sin instead of being free. <coughs> Yeshua said, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples. You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. When you twist the word, you don't end up free. You end up in bondage. And sadly, I found the case to be that many folk following fanciful doctrine, the next new thing, tend to be those who are not set on walking righteously. Um... As I say, I, 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 some of these doctrines are really bizarre, and I wonder why people's focus is on such crazy things, and then often it all comes down to the fact that these people are not actually really interested in being surrendered to Yehovah. I mean, the whole duty of man, what is it, to fear God and to keep his commandments? Dead straightforward, dead simple. The whole duty of man is not to go off and follow after every wind of doctrine. And um, I don't, I don't understand people um, <clears throat> who do not recognise what it is that they're doing when they allow themselves to get caught up in all this strange stuff. So the question arises. <clears throat> How are you when temptation comes, when testing comes? Are you like Yeshua in his written? Or are you a bit like Eve, who's added to the word, bent a bit, lets it be twisted a bit, led by desire? Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, who endures temptation. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. It is the genuineness of our repentance and our faith that is tested. And you're blessed if you remain steadfast under trial when you're tested under temptation. And let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So that's what the problem is. Being lured and enticed by your own desire. Rather than dying to self in complete surrender. No. Being led by your own desire. Now when temptation comes, when you're tested, do you give in to desire? Do you disobey and make excuses? <clears throat> oh, it was just too difficult, and it was this, that, and the other. Well, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. There is no excuse. What you're doing is making a willful choice to disobey Jehovah, to rebel against him, rather than to be completely surrendered to him. You just want to do what you want to do, and it's a choice that you've made. There is no, oh, I couldn't help it. Behold, and don't be surprised at the fiery trial. Don't be surprised if tests come along. Okay, and the word there for the fiery trial is purosis. It was just a trial that tests the character. See where you're really at. When it comes upon you to test you as though something strange was happening to you. Peter writes this, Wherein you greatly rejoice though now for a season, if necessary, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, if it's necessary to be tested. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Yeshua HaMashiach. That's for those who endure, not for those who make their excuses, couldn't help it, and are led by their own desires, and basically fail to recognize Jehovah as their Lord and God. So 
So those with a rebellious heart, something comes along that will cause them to stumble. They'll be odds with the word of Yehovah and will seek to twist it to make it fit whatever it is that they're comfortable with or they'll dismiss it or put it to the back, whatever it is they have to do. They will turn their ear from listening to the voice of Yehovah and they will fall. <clears throat> those who are genuine will remain surrendered. doesn't matter how tough it is. They'll just remain surrendered. They'll hold fast to the word. They'll look to Yehovah, grateful for the abundance of blessings, not like Eve focusing on the little thing that's no, no, no. They will focus on the grateful, uh, the, the abundance of things, and they will be grateful for all the blessings that Yehovah has brought their way. And they will worship him in humility. They'll walk in the light. And these are the people who will know life. And we read in Revelation 2 7, He was at near, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies, to him who overcomes. I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The tree of life, which brings life. Now back to Genesis. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, okay, that was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired, all part of the reasons why the fall happened. Desire, pleasing. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. The eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. The Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where art thou? Which actually translates, Where did you go? Um, <clears throat> we have this expression here, Ruach Hayom. Someone once poetically translated into English as the cool of the day literally means at the appointed time for breathing, which is quite bizarre, isn't it? And when they realized that they could not hide from Jehovah what they had done, they tried making excuses rather than repenting. He said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded that you should not eat? The man said, the woman that you gave to me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. So before the fall, he was speaking prophetically. In post-fall, he's blaming Yehovah and Eve for his sin. What we say is important and our words are powerful. Remember, Yehovah created with his words. At first, Adam was a total shalom with Eve. He describes it as bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. After eating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam called it the woman you assigned to me. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Right after the fall, Yehovah announces his plan of redemption. We see his ear death enters into creation, but Yehovah will bring redemption through Yeshua. Read in 1 Corinthians 15, For as by man came death, by a man has came also the resurrection of the dead. Remember, Hasatan has the power of death, and because we sinned, he has power over us. The soul that sins dies, but Yehovah ransomed us for the hands of one stronger than us, Yeshua died to pay our ransom. 1 Peter 1. You were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. All those who come to Yehovah in repentance are ransomed and forgiven of their sins. And in Micah 7, 18, it says, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love, kindness. I said, he forgives. We're ransomed from um, having the power of death over us. And I think that's amazing for us to recognize and to know. The God of all creation delights in her said. The God of all creation is merciful and he is kind. The woman, to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. To Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. 
Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So he says, for your sake. Everything he does is restorative, redemptive in nature. It's for your sake that I'm going to do this. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it thou was taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So man now has to suffer to provide for his basic needs. The serpent would not walk upright, but he or it would still move about freely. He or it would still be allowed a place in Jehovah's creation and plan for mankind. The woman would feel pain and it would be severe, but she'd still bring forth children. She would still participate in the divine plan for mankind to be fruitful and multiply. She would even bear the seed of Messiah. The man would have to work the soil and toil and sweat, but he would still have dominion over creation and rule over the earth. Yehovah is gracious. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord make coats of skins and clothe them. The Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Okay, comes the exile. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. And the trees of Eden currently in Sheol according to Ezekiel 31 which is also in paradise according to Luke 23, Matthew 12, 14. As we've said many times, this is a recurring theme in the Torah, indeed, throughout the Scripture. Man sins and is exiled. The theme of the whole word of Jehovah is pretty much about getting back to the garden and the blessings when God saw, and it was good. So Adam and Eve were banished from the garden and from the tree of life. Partaking of the tree of life brought eternal life. And Solomon tells us that the Torah associated with wisdom is a tree of life. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who retain her. Now, when Jehovah banned Adam from the garden to prevent him eating from the tree of life, it tells us that the way was guarded by cherubim. The only other place we find cherubim in the Torah is on the Ark of the Covenant, which contains the ten words that represent the Torah. Following the Torah, the tree of life, is all about getting back to that place of fellowship with Jehovah, getting back to the garden to the tree of life. It's all about relationship with him. So let's quickly look at the garden itself. The garden of Eden or Gan Eden. Also described in scripture as the garden of Jehovah. Genesis 13, 10. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of Jehovah. Like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zohar. Now this word Eden. Delight. Pleasure. Okay. <clears throat> the root word, the same as this word here, H5730. Where do we see this? This word is actually translated as pleasure in the accounts of Sarah, laughing at hearing that she is to bear a child in her old age. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, Am I waxed old? Shall I have pleasure? And it's this word, Eden, my Lord being old also. And it's from... This word, H5727. So what's this word? A dent. Okay. It is to be soft or pleasant, figuratively, reflexively, to live voluptuously, um, delight, self. So this place where Jehovah walked with man was a garden of pleasure, a place to delight oneself, a place to live voluptuously. And in Nehemiah, we also this word relate, see the word related to many blessings. They captured fortified cities in a rich land, took possessions of houses full of all good things, cisterns already hewn, vineyards, olive orchards, fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. So all the words associated with this garden point to the fact that this was a place of great delight and pleasure and abundance. And when you consider what the garden was, you can't help but wonder how they could have acted the way that they did. I mean, they had relationship with Jehovah, they had eternal life. They must not have appreciated how blessed they were. And is it the same for us? I think it is important that we appreciate how blessed that we are. 
Gratitude is massively important. 1 Thessalonians 5, give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God in Christ Yeshua for you. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving, declare his works with rejoicing. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So the message is clear. Disobedience leads to exile. In obediently following the Torah, we find our way back to the garden. Torah is a tree of life which leads to life eternal. Be careful to do all the words of this Torah. It is no empty word for you, but your very life. Blessed are they that do his commandments, so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So, <coughs> blessed are the obedient, the humble, those who wait on Yehovah, those who seek him, those who walk in the light. These have life. Again, everything points us back to Yeshua, who was the Word made flesh. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Whoever obeys or believes in the Son is eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. The wrath of God remains on him. We read it before. For as by man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Death could not hold him because he was without sin. He rose on the third day, defeating the power of death. And in Acts 2, 24, God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Um, when you consider what Yeshua has done for us, then you cannot help but offer surely, offer him thanks. Now let's finish by quickly reading through the accounts of Cain and Abel. Genesis 4, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of Jehovah. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a worker of the ground. Throughout Scripture, you'll see people who work, um, who are shepherds, um, are generally righteous people. You look at, for example, um, David and um, all pointing to the good shepherd, of course, which is Yeshua. In the course of time, Cain brought to Yehovah an offering of the fruit of the ground. Abel also brought to the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And Yehovah had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard, so Cain was very angry and his face fell. Yehovah said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. You must rule over it. Blessed is the man who is steadfast under trial, who endures temptation. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. You must rule over sin. This speaks of being surrendered yet again. This speaks of bringing the right offering. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Ascribe to Jehovah the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship Jehovah in the splendor of holiness. Bring an offering, draw near, karav, korban. All speaks of these offerings. And it all begins with complete surrender, the Ola. So what we have here is Cain, he doesn't bring an offering that is satisfactory. Um, and he is warned by the Lord, and the Lord said, Sin crouches, its desire is for you. You must rule over it. Um, and there's so many people <coughs> who don't bring an offering acceptable to Jehovah because they're not prepared to come in complete surrender. We must humble ourselves before Yehovah. And of course, it says, worship him in the splendor of holiness. Worship, speaking again of humility. Coming before him as a servant would come before his master. I've been crucified. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Faith synonymous with obedience. Faith synonymous with complete surrender. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, a new has come. It speaks of dying to self, of picking up your cross. Um, and this is an acceptable offering 
to come before the Lord, to completely die to self, to lay down your life before him. So many don't want to do that, do they? Sin crouches at the door. The Lord says you must rule over it. So many like Cain do not bring an acceptable offering to Jehovah. They are not surrendered. They have not bowed the knee. And that is why they struggle with sin. They don't rule over it. They struggle with it. And when they're tested, they're led by desire. Just like Eve was. So that it was pleasant, good for the taste, and desirable. They make excuses. And they'll twist the word if they have to do that. They'll just, whatever shape or form they need to get it. And what do they do? They fall. Those who are genuine remain surrendered when tested, holding fast to the word, looking to Yelva, grateful for the abundance of blessings. Again, gratitude. Worshiping him in humility, they walk in the light. They will know life, life again. He who <laughs> overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, as it's in the midst of the paradise of God. And back to Genesis 4, the Lord said, Why are you so angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Um, there's lots of people, isn't there, who kind of nurture these um, inner battles with with sin and keep going back to things and you know oh and I've done it again and oh I can't believe it and oh I feel so bad and it's it's really not on and it all does come down to the fact that what they bring to the Yehovah is not an offering that is acceptable they're not surrendered they're not bowed down and they don't rule over sin they're led away by their own desires they are not submitted to him and what does sin bring each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire when desire is conceived it gives birth to sin and when sin when it's fully grown brings forth death the complete opposite and when it comes do you make excuses you've got no excuse no temptation has overcome you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. So if you do give in to these desires, that is just a choice you've made. It wasn't beyond your ability to resist and say no. The temptation, he provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. For those who think they can get away with just full going off the and following their own desires and it's going to be okay nothing is hidden from his sight everyone gives account to him all are naked before him Yehovah is the creator of all things he is sovereign over all and we are all accountable before him this is one of the things that terrifies all the people who don't want intelligent design being taught or they don't want creationism being mentioned because they don't want the idea of being accountable to a holy and righteous God because they're unrighteous. That's why they suppress the truth. But we know the truth. We know he's the creator of all things and he's sovereign over all. And yet people think they can steal away. Nothing is hidden from him. And to understand this is powerful. You alone, O Yehovah, you've made the heavens, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them. The heavenly host bows down before you. Yet so many people won't will they? They're stiff-necked and rebellious. By him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. 
O Yahweh, the God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Again, the thing that I want you to take away from today is the fact that Yehovah is God of all creation. He is completely sovereign. Recognize how great and how wonderful He is. Ascribe to Him glory. But recognize who you are and humble yourself before Him. And don't be going on with this game of, oh, this battle I've got with this, that, and the other. Sin, crouching at the door. It's desire is for you to bring death. The Lord says, follow me. Lay down your cross. Let go of the life that you had. Die to all that that you might live. Surrender to me. Follow my, follow me. Listen to my voice and know life. Jeremiah 32, 7. Our Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. So go take a look at creation and see what he's done. And just remember, wow. Yehovah. That is who I follow. He is my master. He is my God. I am his servant. Bless Jehovah, oh my soul, O oh Jehovah, my God. You are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. O oh Jehovah, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There's <laughs> some that are really wacky, isn't there? Really mind boggling. Tell of all his wondrous works. Thus says Jehovah, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am Jehovah, who made all things. Who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of liars, makes fools of diviners, and turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish. So, will you ascribe to him glory and esteem? All the foolish people of the world don't seem to want to bother but will you? Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. We read, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. And of course, when he comes back in glory, I imagine there'll be people standing in awe of him then. He spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Will you recognize who he is and bow before him surrendered? That's the question. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, I pray that we would be a people not focused on anything but the great abundance of the blessings that you've brought in our lives, not on the things that would cause us to fall or to stumble. I pray, Lord, for people who, in this endless cycle of not ruling over sin, I pray, Heavenly Father, that they just stop messing about and just surrender to you completely. Lord, there's so many people in the world who don't recognize you as the creator of all things, but we know it. And we thank you, Lord, for what you have created. We thank you, Lord, that it is you who gives us life. We thank you, Lord, for the abundance of things. It just all speaks of how generous you are and how loving and kind you are. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this Sabbath. We thank you for your word. And we thank you from redeeming us, for redeeming us, and for bringing us life. Amen.